Thank you for, very much for the warm intro and for the amazing setup. <laughs> I think it flows really well into the talk that I'm planning today. And I'd like to just start with this one quote. Raise your words, not voice. It is rain that grow grows flowers, not thunder. And with this, I just want to open your eyes a bit and maybe let go of what your perceptions are of what marketing and business actually does. We can drop that for a second for this talk, and let's just go on a journey to maybe reimagine what marketing could look like. Now, in this speech, I'm not going to try to educate. I'm actually going to try to share more of my personal experiences more than anything, something that I don't have a lot of practice in doing, so please bear with me, because I'm very used to educating and sharing knowledge. <laughs> um, but my journey starts um, somewhere called Yemen. Yemen is in the southern part of the Arabian Peninsula, and over the past eight years, it has been going through the man, the world's man-made sorry, the world's largest man-made humanitarian crisis. It's been facing political, or better said, geopolitical war. It's been a playing ground for the egos to show off who has the bigger ego. <laughs> And it has caused deaths of hundreds of thousands and, dis and mass displacement of millions. Actually, the last stat that I heard was over 70% of Yemen's population is starving to death right now. But my journey actually started in the US and not in Yemen. I was born in the US because my dad was doing a master's degree and so my family was there. Uh, but as a three month old baby, I then moved to Yemen, Sana'a. Sana'a is the capital city, and Yemen is known for its rich biodiversity, for being the main ox exporters and the first exporters of coffee. Mocha stems from the harbor city, El Mocha. And it is also known for the people and their gratitude. With seven years old, I then moved to Germany moving from the, one of the world's poorest countries to one of the world's wealthiest countries. So as you can imagine, the first few days, weeks, if not months, felt like a utopian dream for me. It felt like I landed in the middle of a forest that was basically out of this world. I was pinching myself every day to try to understand when I would wake up. And my dad actually brought us to Germany because he got a job at the United Nations Climate Change Committee, the UNFCCC. And my upbringing was very confusing because I was extremely privileged. I went to one of the top IB international schools, one of the best in the regions. I had, or my family had a salary where we didn't have to stress about money or financial insecurity. But yet, I was constantly feeling guilty about that because I would see my relatives, my families, kind of still suffering under the humanitarian crisis that only got worse as time got worse. Now, also, seeing behind the folds of the UN made me very angry, especially because I was the star model United Nations student in my school, led my model United Nations club, was eager to enter the human development place to better the world because I felt that that was my duty, until I saw how disgusting the UN is, <laughs> how inefficient it is, how politically driven it is, how inefficient, sorry I say that again, but actually it, I can say it one more time, how inefficient it is, and how there is a massive lack of innovation. By the way, for those who don't know, the UNFCCC is the organization that talks a lot about climate change. And during my upbringing, and during this confusing journey of privilege and trying to understand and deal with this privilege that me and my family got, I also started realizing that I didn't feel like I belonged. I lived in a country that if you didn't look like a certain type, it was made very clear that you're not welcomed. This is, if anyone, has been to Germany or knows how it is to live in Germany, I think, yeah, you would probably agree with me, and this is obviously an overgeneralization, but it is also the truth. Me and many others migrants 
felt like we did not belong. So what does that mean? That meant that I saw behind the UN and I was pissed off at the human international development space. And I also constantly felt like I needed to prove my value. So what happened? I fell in love with the unicorn. <laughs> I wanted to prove my worth. And so I did everything that I needed to do to build the next billion dollar startup. And again, I wasn't maybe very aware at that time, but it was because, and thank you so much for the last speeches to, to cue me up on this, it's because I didn't belong and I felt worthless. And over so many years, so about 10 years of working with over 30 startups as a digital marketing consultant, after taking multiple digital marketing courses, and after learning basically most things from YouTube, because business school is pretty shit, I then quickly started to feel the burden of it. <laughs> I was chasing a dream that A, is a mystical dream and does not really exist. And B, I was chasing a dream to fill my void. And I am noticing more and more that most startup founders go through the same thing, if they're not already aware of it. So I started to ask myself, why? Why do we even chase this unicorn dream? What the heck is a unicorn? <laughs> and this is actually when I hit my deep burnout state at the age of 23, whilst I was working for a leading independent venture builder, managing a team of marketers that were all about at least double the age of me. So I realized a few things, a few critical things. So if anyone wants to build a unicorn, which I hope no one does in this room, here's how to build a unicorn 101. You have to act with an egocentric and competitive approach. If you don't, how are you gonna become the best? You have to maximize your profits at all costs because that's how we raise our value. And we have to do our best to reach unlimited growth. Let's just ignore that the world has finite resources, but let's grow forever and ever and ever and ever. And this was a shame because why were we learned this in business schools? Why were we taught this during my marketing degrees and courses that I took? Why do all the role models represent this in the startup world? And during my worst time, during the times where I didn't know if I wanted to continue living on this earth, I stumbled across the concept of a zebra. A zebra, for those who you don't know, a zebra is, first of all, real, and is not a mystical creature. A zebra is an animal that goes with packs we call a pack of a zebra a dazzle. That's also what I call my team. And zebras usually prioritize empathy. They're caring for each other. They don't want to be the best. That's not the point. And so I started to go on this notion of unlearning, unlearning all of the shit that was taught to me in business schools, in all of the Silicon Valley podcasts that I was obsessed with, in all the whole hustle culture and startup toxicity. And I started to understand, well, is this really the cause of marketing? Because I loved marketing and I was pretty good at it as well. So again, part of my crisis was, okay, do I drop marketing now? Do I drop business? Do I drop my entrepreneurial spirit? But I realized that that was not the answer. I realized actually, the answer might sit in marketing. Because marketing, like many other things in business, in politics, in life, is a tool. It's a tool just like language is a tool. If you wanna be mean, you can be mean with language. If you wanna be nice, you can make someone's day with language. So I started to dig also deeper, and I tried to understand why. Why did we come to this place where like you've heard from other speakers, economic systems are built to pressure all of us to beat each other. And I started to find out something very interesting, something that was ne never mentioned in my economics class, even though it was one of my favorite classes in university. It was that A, Adam Smith was first and foremost a philosopher and then an economist, and B, 
that Karl Marx, the inventor of socialist cap uh, communism, sorry, and the pioneer at least, was actually kind of a pal of Adam. And they used to exchange a lot of notes, just like most pioneering philosophers would. And sometimes they even had to go the extra mile and be a bit extreme to make their point as a philosophical statement. Now, during my upbringing, I was taught that you're either a hardcore communist or you're a hardcore capitalist. I think both of them would be extremely disappointed at that notion and that narrative. So I started to reimagine and I started to question myself. How or what if marketing focused on the well-being of our ecosystems rather than the well-being of us as an ego? What if marketing emphasized creating a positive social and environmental impact rather than just boosting our profits until it goes no more? What if marketing actually acknowledges the natural cycles of growth, death, and rebirth? And what if we can embed that in our marketing, branding, and growth strategies from the get-go? What if we can also try to imagine marketing strategies and growth strategies that predict where the growth will stagnate? And this is something that's become actually more and more clear to me, is that our biggest teacher is not the economist of this world, it's not the professors of these worlds, and it's not the Elon Musks of these worlds. Our biggest teacher, sorry, is nature, and it's sitting right in front of us. Nature communicates elegantly with each other. Nature and plants grow really fast at the start, but very dependent on the ecosystem it's in, on the life cycle, and in the circumstances. Nature stagnates in its growth, and nature, like all of us, eventually dies to rebirth. And so today I run a marketing agency, a creative growth agency called Zebra Growth, where we are redefining and paving the way to the next generation of marketing. Marketing that focuses on regeneration. And again, if there's one thing I want you to take out from this speech, it's these three notions. How can we shift our mindsets to being egocentric towards a more ecocentric approach? How can we shift our goals, or at least ultimate goals, from profit to impact? And this is something I have a lot of debates on. All of our clients are profitable, and if they weren't, we wouldn't be working with them. But that's a given. Of course they're gonna make profit, but that's not the end goal. The end goal is systemic change for a better society and a more healthier planet. And again, what if we move from the notion from unlimited growth to growth with a limit? And yes, most investors don't like to hear that. And for a moment, I'd just like you to close your eyes. And I'd just like us to go within and maybe hear again what I just said. But when looking within, we can maybe hear the nature within us. I want us to take three deep breaths in. With your nose, two, three, and exhale through your mouth, two, three. And again, two more times with your nose. You can continue breathing one more time, deep through your nose, and slowly through your mouth. Please keep your eyes shut if you haven't already shut them. And I want you now to go back to your natural breath. Don't try to control it. Don't try to extend it. I just want, to, I want you to observe the natural cycle of your breath. Is it fast? Is it slow? Is it deep? Or is it shallow? 
Now, removing your observations from your breath, I just want you to hear my words, and I want you to reimagine with me what the future of marketing could look like. <coughs> what if we replaced ego-driven marketing with eco-driven marketing, considering and appreciating all of our interconnectedness? What if we committed to making a tangible difference in, our, in people's lives and our health of our planet through our marketing efforts, instead of obsessing on higher and higher and higher profits? And what if we embraced the idea that businesses could grow and evolve organically without artificially blowing them up in value to, dream, to treat them like a gambling machine, but actually grow in harmony with nature's cycles? It's time to put nature, animals, and people at the center of business and marketing. And yes, I could have just wrote nature because we are all one. <laughs> but just to make it clear. Thank you very much, and I hope you can join me in redefining what marketing can look like. Thank you.